won't be long. Better back them up, boys. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3. I, I, I was really excited about this, but this, and, and the word excites me anyway, but I, I really was excited about this chapter as I studied today. Um, there's some things that we talk about all the time, and I, and I can just see the pictures uh, of that as we come into a place in in as we come into this chapter, and actually the last song that we sang reminded me so much of the things that I could see the pictures of today and uh, exactly what uh, what it was showing us. So, um, Tamara, if you'll put that last song up there. That, now, it's got to stop. Uh, it says, take me past the outer courts and through the holy place, past the brazen altar, Lord, I want to see your face. And, uh, the, and, it, and if we look at those places, uh, you realize that God's made a way for us to get from one place to another. And a place that he's made a way for us is, and in, in, go to the next verse. The place it says right there that uh, I hunger and thirst for your righteousness and it's only found one place. And it goes on to the next verse and it says it's through the blood of the Lamb. And going back to that first verse again, and, and looking at that, um, this all takes an action. It's not just something that I can't, I can't sit in a chair, I can't sit on a pew, I can't sit back and say, well, God, do it for me. I've got to move with Him. In order to have, even though He paid for it with the blood of the Lamb, even though His righteousness, I have to thirst for His righteousness. I have to be ready to get up and move with Him in order to have His righteousness come to pass in my life. See, it's free, but I have to do something. And that's the picture that I saw. Thank you. Uh, and that's the picture that I saw in this chapter. Um, so let's start with uh, verse 3. It says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, At this time, Paul actually was a prisoner. He was released again. He actually was a prisoner. But as I looked at that place, he wasn't referring to just being a prisoner in prison. He had a mission in life that Christ was his desire. And exactly what that song said is it said, I, desire, I hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Well, that's the picture that I, I saw as I started reading this with Paul. Paul was called the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, even though he was a Jew, even though he was a Pharisee, he uh, was, was educated as a Pharisee. Um, that would be uh, in uh, real close to to having a doctorate uh, in today's education and the kind of education that they had to go through uh, for that. It says, indeed, verse 2, indeed, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace which God has given me for you, how that by revelation... He made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already. By which when you read that you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, I want to look at a couple of, of meanings in this. 
in uh, I always love when I don't touch the right place and it doesn't go back. If, you'll, if you've got a Spirit-filled life Bible, if you go to Mark 13, 14 and look at the word wealth, there it, was, it talks about the reader understanding. He says in, in, the, in the verse before in Mark 13, 14, it says, uh, let the reader understand. Reader was the same word that was used as Paul said, said that uh, he, as you read, originally to know exactly, to know over and over again, to recognize the word came to meaning, mean reading aloud to oneself or to the congregation. And so when Paul said that, uh, he was talking about uh, coming into a place that we read, I know that I know that I know that I know. In other words, you came too late to tell me that this isn't what it means. And this isn't what it says. So it was a revelation that comes. And remember what Romans says. And I love the way the Bible uh, ties together. Because Romans uh, ten seventeen says what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And, and you've heard me share before that... I read the word aloud so my ears hear it. Because I know that I know that I know that the word works and that it's true. But it takes an action on my part. And I think that's why that that song stands out. And, And I love the song. But I realize tonight how come I love the song so much. Because it talks about the interaction between me and God. And the part that I play in having with God, you know, and in, in, in receiving, I've heard it said, I've heard people say, there's nothing you can do to earn anything from God. Everything God gave is grace. That is true. But there is a part that I play to receive that grace. Not that I earn it, but that I receive it because I act on that faith and I move into that place and I begin to understand. I, I love our uh, our kids in in uh, I think this is uh, something that I say a lot of times when they're in the other room, but they need to know because they act on that word. We watch how God works in their life because they simply believe that it's true because they just do it, and so and and that's really what Paul was talking about. And now. There, there was a, a ne- the next thing he said uh, in that same verse, he said, as you read that you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So if you've got a Spirit-filled life Bible, go, go to Luke 2.47 and we'll look at the word wealth right there about understand. Um, I was waiting to see if I heard pages turning because I don't want to go so fast. I believe that this is uh, that this chapter is so rich, even though it looks simple. And this is one of the things that we have to understand. Just because it's simple doesn't mean it's not rich. Just because it's simple doesn't mean that we can't get it. Oh well, you know that's real easy. I want to I want to get over into this other part where I got to figure out how it works and how it goes. In this chapter, he actually even uh, addresses that particular way of thinking. Understanding is the word sunus. Strong's literally, it, Strong says it literally putting a putting together. Hence, quickness of apprehension. The critical faculty for clear apprehension, intelligent assessing a situation comparable to the modern idiom, putting two and two together. The New Testament uses two words for understanding. Phanois and sanus. Phanois acts while sanus judges. 
Phenous is the practical side of the mind, where sinous is the analyzing and discerning side. Now, there's two things that happen with understanding and in, in looking at the word and how it is. I can make a choice which one of the understanding I'm going to operate in. Am I going to operate in practical application or am I going to try to figure out what it means? And that's what I was saying about our kids. Our kids just look at it, they see it, they receive it, and they move on. And we begin to see how it works in their life over and over and over again. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a place where that understanding is just the practical side of the mind where it just says, you know what, this is what it says, and this is how I'm going to do it. It's simply as, as easy as, as reading the instructions, and that's what Paul was talking about, that you will have an understanding of my knowledge. And that's what Paul did. Paul, uh, at the first part, uh, was operating in the wrong kind of understanding because he believed what, what all of his uh, Jewish peers said, and he went after the Christians, trying to figure out. And when God knocked him off his horse, he got up and he just did. He had an understanding that if I just do what he says, I receive by faith, and so I walk and I go ahead and do that. We see how, uh, how God began to move through Paul. I believe that that simply uh, understanding and that simple ability to be able to just say, okay, God, I'll just do it. That that was why God was able to use Paul so greatly and able to take him and to uh, write two-thirds of the New Testament through Paul because he just did what God told him to do. Verse 5, so he acted. And, and I think that's a, the main message of this particular uh, chapter. Uh, if you, and, and, and I believe that all Spirit-filled life Bibles have this. Uh, the, the heading right here was mystery revealed. You know, the, the mystery of God was revealed to Paul, and then he just acted on what was revealed. And that was a lesson to me, that all I have to do is act on what his word says, and I'll begin to receive exactly what that word says. Verse 5, "...which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise through the gospel." And I, and I want to look at that word heirs. Uh, Hebrews 11.9 there's a word wealth right there uh, that, it, that tells us what heirs are. And, and many times through the New Testament, it's assumed that Paul was the writer of Hebrews, but it's not known that. It was only, it's only assumed that Paul was the writer of Hebrews uh, because he wasn't the apostle to the, to the Jews or the Hebrews. He was the, called the apostle to the Gentiles. It was only assumed that he wrote uh, the Hebrews simply because of the style of the writing that was done matched what Paul had written before. Uh, again, not saying that he is the writer, but when you look at the word heirs, it's from son with kalerno, a lot to possess... The word denotes a joint participation, co-heir, fellow heir, one who receives a lot from the other. And all of a sudden, I got a whole picture. You see why that song spoke so much? Because it speaks of having something that somebody else has just because I have part of what they have. Just because I'm a partaker in what they have, what they do. And so when Paul talks about being uh, fellow heirs, he's talking about possessing what God's already done through Jesus Christ and revealed by the Holy Spirit in our life and through us and, and to us uh, through the Holy Spirit. 
Verse 7 says, Of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace that God had giving, given me for the effectual working of His power. Now, I want to I want to look at this working of His power because He talks about this again later in this chapter, and it's important to understand the working of His power in that place. If you've got a Spirit-filled life Bible, go to Colossians one twenty nine. And it talks about the working. It's energeia. Now, it comes from the string of the dynamo power that comes through the power of Jesus Christ and revealed by the Holy Spirit when we talk about the dynamo, that it becomes something that builds and builds and builds. Well, this is, this is what the... And even though it's in the string, what it says is working action, operative power. The English word energy comes from this word. Energia usually describes the working of God, but it's used by Satan's empowering the lawless one in Second Thessalonians 2 9. So if I'm going to participate as an heir, then what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to allow His power that it talked about right there in that, in that begin to work in me so that I can participate. Now, the heading on this next part is, is uh, the purpose of the mystery. Mystery revealed. God reveals the mystery of what Christ did, how He is to work in us, work through us as we participate. And we see we had to take a participation of that for that power to work in us. Then Paul, or, or the writer of this uh, uh, new uh, Spirit-filled Life Bible, wrote purpose of the mystery in, in these next few verses. Verse 8 says, To me, who I am less than the least of all the saints, this grace is, was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I looked up unsearchable. It says, unable to consummate, to fathom, or understand. So in other words, the only way that we can understand the the... Uh, riches of Christ, the part of Christ, the participation of Christ comes in that place that I begin to participate, I begin to have, I begin to operate in it, and then I begin to have a revelation of it because I can't understand it any other way. And that's what that, that unsearchable actually meant in that place. Verse 9 says, To make... All what is the fellowship of the mystery, which is from the beginning of the ages, has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus. And I looked at, and, and I want to look at that word fellowship because we, we looked at, at understanding. We looked at uh, this is go to Acts 2:42. And we'll look at the word wealth there. Uh, fellowship, and, and we understand fellowship from the word communion. When we have communion uh, in, uh, in church, just like we did on Christmas Eve. But what, what we look at that fellowship, it's the word konia. Which konia is the same word as communion. And it says sharing unity, close association partnership, participation, a society, a communion, a fellowship, contributory help, the brotherhood. Konia is a unity brought about by the Holy Spirit. In Konia, the individual shares a common and intimate bond of fellowship with the rest of the Christian society. Konia submits the believers 
to the Lord Jesus and to each other. So we get into a place that we begin to understand, and, and I haven't, uh, I actually uh, haven't had the opportunity to listen to last Wednesday night, but what I understand that John talked about was how oneness comes and that unity comes by believers and by Christ, how we're all tied together. Is, is that in a nutshell what he talked about? Okay. When we look at that, we get into a place that we, and, and, and how that tied with the word fellowship here to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. You know, I've got to have fellowship. I've got to have a partnership. I've got to become one with the mystery of Christ. I've got to uh, begin to draw all of my uh, thinking from what Christ did. I've got to think, draw all of my thinking and become unified with that. And that's what Paul was talking about in this place. So that uh, I can have everything, the blessings that the Bible talks about, fall in my place. I don't, is there anybody in here that doesn't want to be blessed? Okay. I want to be blessed going and coming. I want to be blessed in everything I do. Uh, but... It takes a participation, and I understand that. It takes my participation in a partnership with what God's done. And that's what Paul's talking about here. We go to verse 10. It says, The intent is to know the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. What did it say? See, it doesn't say by God. It says that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, not to the church, but by the church, to the principalities and the powers in heavenly places. So the manifold wisdom of God, and if you look right under that, the meaning of of manifold in this place is right there. It's uh, from much and varied, many colored. The word pictures... God's wisdom as much varied, with many shades, tints, hues, colorful expressions. As, as a God of variety, He is still entering, in, entering the human arena, displaying many-sided, multicolored, and much vigorated wisdom to His people. And I love this. And through his people. Because what we see, you know, and I, I think it's, I think it's, it's uh, even though God doesn't change, God has plans. He doesn't plan for me and Dick to be exactly the same. Because Dick has other gifts than I have. And God wants to use his gifts in a different way to reach other people that I'll never reach. And see, and he does that, I could go around the room and we do that with everybody because God has created each one of us with a different kind of personality. Some of them that uh, sometimes our personalities are so different that we kind of, sometimes you even want to look at somebody and go, man, I can't believe they think that or they said that. But God created them that way so that he could use them that way. And I'm not talking about off the wall stuff or or some kind of way off belief, but I'm talking about as the body of Christ begins to walk in the wisdom of God that he uses those gifts and those different uh, uh, personalities to glorify him in the earth today. But it takes participation of each one of us to do that in a different way. My wife has different gifts than I have. Praise God he put us together. Because those gifts begin to uh, work together to accomplish. And that's what he wants those gifts to do. It, with us as a body, as, as a, uh, a church, he wants our gifts to complement one another that we can reach everybody around us in that place. The purpose of the mystery isn't just so I can go, well, I got it. But it's so that we can may, may know who God is to the principalities and the powers in heavenly places. Uh, verse 11. 
I think I'm going to join Billy and I'm going to put my jacket on because the heater didn't stay on very long. Um, verse 11 says, According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ our Lord. I want to look at the meaning of that word purpose because he came and, and in his eternal purpose... I'm going to tell you, this brings a whole different light on a verse that has been manipulated by a lot of people to make an excuse for all kinds of junk that goes on in their life. So turn to Romans 8, 28. The purpose is right there. It made me understand that this purpose is bigger. You know, we all, everybody, I believe every Christian learns Romans 8, 28. Uh, for all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. What is His purpose? See, and this is why this verse takes on a different uh, light than what a lot of people used to. Well, you know, I don't know what God's trying to teach me through this. God didn't have nothing to do with it. If it wasn't good and perfect, God didn't have anything to do with what happened. But He had a purpose in everything. And that's the place that, it, that it, it comes. Purpose is from the word pro and thesis. It means before a place, thus a setting forth. The word suggests a de deliberate plan, a proposition, an advanced plan, an intention and, decide, and design. Of 12 occurrences in the New Testament, Prothus is used four times for the Levitical showbread, literally the bread of setting before. Most of the other uses point to God's eternal purpose relating to salvation. Our personal salvation was not only well planned, but distressed demonstrates God's abiding faithfulness as he waits the consummation of his great plan for his church. What is his great plan for his church? One we know is to be with him after this life is over. But we also know that it's part of his plan that everything that I do glorifies him. And so when I come to that place, how I act or react, and this is a place that that this verse took on a whole new meaning. How I act or react in any given situation, any tribulation, any trial that comes along, uh, it will directly reflect on how I accomplish the purpose that God had uh, for me in in His plan. And what was what was, what is His purpose? That. The reality of the Lordship of Jesus Christ is established in the earth today and that God is glorified in everything that I do. Verse 12 says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. So what does it say? What is faith? What is faith? Believing. Okay. Does it take an action? It takes a participation. See, that's what I was looking for is because everything that Paul talks about in this chapter is, takes a participation by me. If I'm going to act in faith, like this verse says, through faith... Through faith in Him, capital H. We know that in Him, that means in Jesus Christ. So what I have to do? I have to make a decision that I believe and I'm going to act on what He says. Is that right? The reason that I was prompting you about, about that is because I really, this is the thing that drove home so much about, and, and if you look back all the way at the first part of Ephesians and to now, 
Everything that Paul talked about, he prayed that we would, in the first chapter, he prayed that we would receive wisdom and knowledge of who God was and God is. Um, then in the second chapter, he talked about our participation as a church. He's going on in the third chapter, and he's talking about our participation in the, as a church to let the demons, the principalities, the powers in heavenly places know that God has a plan. And his plan is they're done. And that's the place that we come. But it takes a participation on my part. I can't just sit there and, and uh, um, warm the pew and enjoy church on Sunday and Wednesday night, and even though it's cold, and, uh, and act uh, just like, well, you know, it'll all come to pass. God's plan will all... There's a, lo- there's a reason that there are... Thousands of Christians that never reach that place that they obtain the promises of God because they sit and wait for that. We can't, and that's what Paul's talking about. We've got to get in a place that I begin to act on it. I can't just hope it goes away, but I've got to begin to act in faith. I act like it's already gone because it is already gone. It's already done. I've got to get in a, in a place that I've got to participate with what he said. Verse 13 says, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And I looked, looked at that word tribulations. What it said was adversities. So Paul said, All the adversities that I've gone through are simply so that you can understand who the knowledge... Somebody goes, well... You know, how did him being in jail have anything to do with... He got put in jail because he was acting on the faith that he had. Not because he was sitting around watching somebody else do it. But because he was acting out exactly what God said. And how God said to do it. And that landed him in jail at that time. Um, Praise God, we live in a place that I can just go ahead and go on. And I don't have to to worry about landing in jail. But if I was going to land in jail, would I change what I was doing? I can't change what I'm doing if I'm going to obtain the promises that God has. And that's, that's the point that Paul's making, which is your glory. Uh, the heading on the next part is appreciation of the mystery. Verse 14 says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. To be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Grant goes back to Acts 20. 35 is where the word wealth is uh, for that particular word. And uh, it says that the word is didomai, which is to give, grant, allowing, bestowing, imparting, permitting, placing, offering, presenting, yielding, and paying. It implies giving an object of value and it is freely and unen- it is freely and is unenforced indicates that the giver takes on the character of Christ whose nature is to give and so we get into that place and in this particular place it, it's talking about it's more blessed to give than it is to receive but Paul used exactly the same word in this place that he would grant to you according to the riches. In other words, he's just going to give it to you. But what happens if I, if I take an action where I'm going to receive something? Receive it, but how do you receive it? You got to get them and get it. I've used the example before, and I don't have any money in my pocket, so I can't hold up a five dollar bill and have to watch the kids all run to get it. Because, because, because I, I promise you, the kids will be the first ones here. And uh, look at Catherine grin. 
She says, well, I wish you had $5 so you could hold it up. She's on the front row. But it's exactly that way. God is, is wanting to give us his uh, personality, his way of thinking, his way of doing things. And that's what, he's, what Paul's talking about. He's imparted that particular gift to us. Uh, it goes on, and, and, it, and it's through the Holy Spirit to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the inner man. Why do we need to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the inner man? Okay, so we can take it, but, but we have to take it to be strengthened in the inner man. It's so we don't get discouraged. Does anybody ever not get tempted, not have to use your shield of faith to ward off the wiles of the devil? Do we have to do that? I'm not going to get ahead of myself and get to the end of the sixth chapter yet. But it all ties together. If I'm going to be strengthened on the inner man, then I've got to have... So how does faith come? Hearing the word. Does it come by somebody else preaching? It builds us up because we hear the word, but it comes because I hear the word. If, if I'm reading the word to myself, you know, it's cool because we got uh, uh, some Bibles out there that you can listen to on your radio going down the road, and they don't put you to sleep now because they've got different uh, guys doing them than, than they used to. But what do I have to do? I have to choose to listen to it. I have to choose to read it. And then I become, and, and then, then the Holy Spirit has to, remember what Jesus said? When the Comforter comes, He will what? Teach you of things I've said. So He teaches us while we're reading and things. He'll remind you of things I've said. So when we get to a place that we're going through tribulations or uh, adversities, then what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit reminds me. See, and we look at this, and this is how we're strengthened in the inner man. Because the Holy Spirit keeps bringing that, teaches us, reminds us, rises up inside of us, and says, hey, that ain't right. And, and we get into a position that we understand that it's from the Holy Spirit being in us. And that's what Paul's talking about, that He would grant to you, according to the riches in His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. And there's a lot of people that try to just do it on their faith and not let the Holy Spirit begin to build that faith up, begin to grow that faith inside of you. Verse 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through what? Through simply believing that you be rooted being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that you'll be filled with the fullness of God. Fullness of it says full mom number, full complement, full measure, copiousness, plenitude. I didn't even know plenitude was a word until I read it there. That which has been that which has been completed. Fulfilled. There it's we come into a place that we See, I've got to understand and know, and this is what Paul talked about through this whole chapter, was I know that I know that I have been given something that has completed me, that has filled me up, that is a done thing, not something that's still a work in progress. The only thing that's a work in progress is me because I need to come into an understanding of the fullness 
of God. And the sooner that I come into an understanding of the fullness of God, then I comprehend, I understand that he's already done it. He gave me a complete package so that I can have all the things that, that are the blessings that God wants me to have. The word describes a, describes a ship with a full cargo and crew in a town with no empty houses. Strong, it strongly emphasizes fullness and completion. So what Paul said was to the glory uh, to know the love of Christ that passes all un, uh, all knowledge that you may be filled with a complete understanding and a completeness of what God has done. Verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Do you remember when I told you that again he would talk about this word? Work, the power that works in us, refers back to a word wealth in in 1 Thessalonians uh, 2.13. And that word wealth says is effectively, it's energo. And remember, the last one was what? Energi? So we have, we realize that here's another one in that string of of, uh, the meanings. One of the four big energy words, energo, energies, energia, and energema, the words all stem from in and work and have to do with the active operation or working of power and its effectual results. So when I look at that and I look at what Paul says in this ending of this chapter, What he said is now who is able to do exceedingly above all that we think or ask according to how it works inside of me. So now I've got another what? Somebody say participation. See, it takes a participation for that power to work in me. It's not just something. It's already paid for. It's already completed. It can already happen. But I have to have a part in that. So he said he's able to do it exceedingly and abundantly above all I can think or ask. And a lot of people stop right there. But it's according to the power that works in me. So if I have the understanding of completeness in my life, then what's going to happen is what I think and ask, it's going to happen faster. Because I understand, I know that I know that I know, and, and thus you understand more why I say a lot of times, you came too late to tell me it doesn't work because the power inside of me has seen it happen over and over and over again. And we get in that place that we, we understand that uh, God can change things. I, I'm, I'm just going to share something. I, I, re, I believe this. And in fact, I, I, might, I might ask him and put him on the spot. But I believe that the first time that I know of, that Roddy Qualls grabbed uh, something that was broken was my hand. I'm going to tell you, uh, in the flesh, I thought he was going to break it worse. But he grabbed that hand and he hung on to it and he said, in the name of Jesus, I tell this hand to be healed. And I mean right then. Had you ever done that before? Can somebody convince you it doesn't work now? See, this is the thing. That all I have to do is participate in what it happens so that I begin to get a revelation. The first time I, I raised a kid from the dead in a rodeo arena, Scott was there. You, I'll tell you, you can't convince me that it won't happen now. You can't convince me. Now, I'm not sure how they're going to feel about it because they're saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and they're already in the presence of God. But if God moves on me, and I've been places since then, I, I, I raised uh, one more from the dead since then, but I, I've been places that I didn't lay hands on them. Because 
They were in the presence of God. God didn't tell me to do it. He told me to do it that time. And, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, I know, I'm convinced that it works. But I'm not convinced that I do it every time. We've got to listen to the Holy Ghost. What's it going to do? Is it going to glorify God? There's a lady in East Texas that uh, died. You'll, you'll enjoy this. Um, and, and someday we'll have uh, Bill and Karen Shaw here. Uh, but Bill and Karen Shaw, who have been in, uh, they did the high school rodeo ministry for 28 years. And now they're youth pastors in East Texas in, in uh, one of our churches over there that the pastors ordained with with uh, this church. And uh, they were in Chili's Restaurant in Nacogdoches, Texas. And this lady died sitting at a table in Chili's. She'd been dead 15 minutes. And Karen Shaw went over and commanded that she come to life. And she, you know what happened? She didn't come to life right away. Karen Shaw says, I st- said... Devil, loose your hands in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I speak life in this body and this woman come alive. Fifteen minutes later. And uh, because she came alive, she accepted. She didn't know Jesus. She accepted Jesus as her Savior. And today is still alive. This only happened about three or four months ago now. I think about three months ago is is when uh, uh, Bill was telling me about it, and and what was that? It's according to the power that works in us. We've got to do. We've got to participate. It's just like what I asked Roddy a minute ago. Had you ever done that before? And can anybody convince you that it doesn't work now? Because what happens is that power grows as we participate with God in what He's doing through Jesus Christ. Last verse says, To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen simply means let it be so. It says, To him be glory in the church. So Christ and the understanding of Jesus Christ in the church by you and I is what glorifies God. And Paul's saying... To Him be glory through the church, in the church, so that Jesus Christ is... And and you'll find that everything that Paul ever talks about is establishing the reality of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in the earth and glorifying God the Father. And and, and I love the way that he does that. I believe that uh, this... uh, this third chapter, um, Ephesians isn't broken up in two different letters. But the way that Paul ended the third chapter, I believe that he meant for that to be the end of the letter. And then God began to show him more. And we'll look at that as, as, as we uh, go along next, next Wednesday. We'll go on to the fourth. I had to think if there was something we were doing next Wednesday. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to uh, study your word. Father, I thank you for everything that you show us, that you give us revelation knowledge in that word and that we grow. And Father, I just give you glory and honor and power in the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood, amen. Remember that Jesus loves you and so do we. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your Savior and then making him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. 
That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior, and He is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching, and so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make Him the Lord of your life. And as you make Him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation, uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo, and uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you, He'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus loves you, and so do we.